Hello students, welcome to this lesson on Marxism. Marxism, which starts off as a theory of economic political significance, has moved into criticism in social sciences and the humanities. Marxist criticism is visible in anthropology, the study of literature, art history, and several other related domains. The lesson will focus on the key concepts within Marxism and enable you to understand how certain key terms like ideology, representation, and hegemony are central to Marxist analysis of society and culture. Marxism's focus was and remains the question of power, power relations among social classes in any society and cultural formation. It relates questions of culture, whether it's literature or film, music or art, to the question of actual market forces, industries, labor, what is called the material conditions of production. We'll begin with our first module of an introduction to Marxist thought. Marxist thought originates in the writings of Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels, two 19th century German thinkers. Both Marx and Engels began with work in philosophy, but with a strong interest in economics and political theory. Their major works, such as the Communist Manifesto, Das Kapital, and others, insisted that we need to rethink the way in which analysis of culture is done. For example, their famous slogan, philosophers have always interpreted the world, the point is to change it, argues a case that cultural analysis must take into account actual economic conditions prevailing in any society. The Marxist view of society is that all societies have classes that are in conflict with each other. Upper classes who have power work, strive and fight to retain that power. The working classes seek power, seek a fair amount of representation. All society, all social order is essentially a conflict between classes. The conflict over who controls the factors of production, which includes economics primarily. Marxism argues that the upper classes seek to retain their power, their domination over the working classes, a process they call hegemony. Hegemony is the domination of the upper classes through various means over the lower classes. In Marxism, the most significant component of any society is the economic condition. It is the factors of production, land, labor, wage, profits, the mechanics of production that determine the nature of any society. Marxists argue that particular classes, such as industrialists, landlords, feudal lords, control the factors of production. The working classes do not have any control over what they produce. They only work as laboring bodies. That is, what Marxism forces us to see is that the conditions of production are determined by, are influenced by, the people who control them, but the people who actually do the work have no control over what they produce. That is the economic foundation for all social and cultural practices. Marxism believes that this economic foundation is the base. All cultural practices such as art, education, religion constitute the superstructure. This is the famous Marxist theory of base and superstructure. This is the two-tier model within Marxism. It is to do with the factors of production, land, labor, organization, manpower, wage, and superstructure includes all the cultural practices within which we live. It includes religion, uh, education, uh, films, music, art, the textbooks that you read, the films that we watch, uh, the music that we enjoy. The superstructure is more or less, in Marxist theory, determined by the nature of the base. 
to reduce it to a formula, Marxism argues that all cultural practices reflect the nature of the economic base. All superstructure is, in the Marxist sense, determined by the economic base. Marxism argues that every class produces its own kind of cultural practices. Me as an individual, you as a group, a group of students in a particular school or college, Indians as a nation, we all believe that we share certain values, certain attitudes, certain behavioral forms. Marxism argues that as an individual, I am influenced by the economic condition in society. You as a group are influenced by the economic conditions in any society. In other words, what Marxism wants us to understand very clearly is that our cultural attitudes are not independent of the economic basis of our societies. Think about how we talk about middle class values. We talk about high class taste. We talk about corporate culture. We talk about mass culture or middle class culture. What exactly are we talking about when we do this? In the Marxist interpretation, every class produces a set of behavior, attitudes, but also produces cultural artifacts. Abstract things like truth, beauty, values, or morals are not abstractions. They come out of a particular social and economic foundation. In a sense, Marxism believes that any work of art, whether it's a novel or a film or a piece of music, comes out of this particular economic foundation. All art reflects the social conditions of that particular society in that particular period. Let's take a common example from literature, Arkanarayan's fiction. Arkanarayan's fiction set in Malgudi might be read, if you were doing a Marxist analysis, as a reflection of the social conditions in a small village in southern India. It talks about Brahminical cultures, the cultures of the bank, the culture of the school, the arrival of the English language texts in the classroom, the little cricket matches, attitude towards parents and grandparents, business transactions, the commercial castes that we see in villages, and so on and so forth. Any imaginative work in Marxist theory is not purely the effect or the articulation of the imagination. Even imaginative works like fiction have a foundation in very real material conditions. So abstract things like beauty or truth have material foundations, which is why Marxism is often called materialist criticism. Why materialist? Because it sees things like beauty, truth, moral values, when we define, say, things like good or evil, all have material foundations. Even abstract qualities are founded upon the economic base, the economic foundations in any society. It is determined by consumer cultures where money and goods are a plenty. It's determined by feudal cultures, if that is the case, where the let me take an example to illustrate this for you. Think of native traditions within literature or arts in India. It was the king, the court, the monarch who supported the poets and the painters. In a system called the patronage system, a certain form of art evolves because the money for the poet or the painter to live is supplied by the king. Naturally, the poet or the painter is not likely to be writing things against the monarchy or the king. Therefore, what we are seeing is the kind of art produced by um, poets or story writers or storytellers in ancient India is not only the result of their powers of the imagination, but because the king supplies them the money to get the food to get the house in which they have to live, to get the food which they have to eat. In other words, what 
Marxism proposes is that these forms of art are directly connected to who is supporting them financially. It is directly connected to how their economic conditions are. Right? So we need to think of it as materialist criticism because it is the material conditions of the life of the poet, of the life of the artist that ultimately determines what kind of art gets produced. Um, having said that, we also need to then understand that cultural products such as films or novels, I use the example of Arke Narayan, reflect social realities. Are these artifacts conveying a direct, clear picture of reality? This is the subject of our next module, which deals with ideology, hegemony, and false consciousness. All cultural artifacts reflect social realities. In Marxist terms, they represent social realities. Marxism believes that cultural forms, whether it's film or music or a novel, functions as an instrument through which the upper classes retain their power over lower classes or the working class. What do we mean by this? Remember, we began with the argument that Marxism believes in social conflict as the foundation of all society. The upper classes possess power, the lower classes don't. The upper classes wish to retain power and the working classes contest that. Now the important thing here is to recognize that the upper classes need to continue the domination of the working class. In order to keep this domination at full throttle, they need a specific kind of method. Marxism believes that culture is the method through which domination is achieved and retained. The portrayal of social realities actually carries a hidden message so that the working classes who watch a film begin to believe it. All representation leads us to believe in what we are seeing on the screen or reading in a book. Marxism argues that all power is retained because the upper classes manage to convince the working classes that this is natural. This process is called ideology. Ideology is the process through which social injustice, inequality, suffering is presented as natural. That is, at no point are the working classes told that they need to rebel. Instead, cultural forms like films suggest to them that it is all right to be suffering it is all right to be the way they are. Ideology is what the Marxists call false consciousness. It is what convinces the working classes not to rebel. Films often disguise the exploitative nature of society. Ideology also works to produce different kinds of political attitudes. Let's take an example. Let's take any of the very violent military nationalist films whether it's LOC or Border or the numerous uh, Sunnydale films that we see on television these days, these films show a particular kind of nationalism where a particular country becomes the enemy and the Indians become heroes. It reduces a very complex and complicated political situation into a simple formula. As Indians, we should behave in a certain way towards this particular neighboring country of ours. What we are seeing here is ideology in operation which convinces us as a community of Indians that this is our enemy and this is how patriotism should be. They are all enemies and dirty terrorists. We are good people. For us to accept that is the success of ideology. Please note again the significance of what Marxists are saying. Cultural practices mask the complicated nature of politics and social realities. They present to us one vision, one version of it, which then becomes natural. The cultural practice, the cultural artifact, whether it's a film or a book, may or may not have anything to do with the social realities, but because it is put across to us with very effective methods of representation, we begin to believe it.
most of the time, working classes, the oppressed, do not recognize that they are oppressed, do not recognize that they are being exploited. They do not recognize it because power is most effective when power is operating in invisible ways. When power is visible, there will be resistance. In order to prevent this possibility, the risk of resistance, what is normally done is that power works in very invisible, very secretive ways. There is an important consequence of this. The workers who do not recognize they are being exploited, the oppressed who do not know they are being oppressed, will never rebel because they assume this is their natural condition in life. We do not necessarily recognize oppression and therefore we begin to accept it as natural since you do not know anything else. What Marxism does is something very important here. Marxism shows that power operates in invisible ways and not necessarily through military might. It is not always the police, law and order systems or the military that imposes power. According to the Marxists, and especially later Marxists, uh, I'll come to that in a minute, power operates through what they call civil apparatuses. What are civil apparatuses? Education, religion, family structures, advertising, newspapers. We do not recognize power. We do not recognize operations of power because we think of it only as entertainment. Let me give you an example through which we can make more sense of what I'm talking about right now. Think of the advertisement for toothpastes on television. There are people in white coats who tell us that a particular toothpaste is good for you and a particular toothpaste does these things for you and that if you're using any other toothpaste, it's time to change. Please note this. It is not the toothpaste that is convincing us. It is the person in the white coat who convinces us. The minute a doctor appears on screen, we trust the doctor as somebody reliable. That is ideology. The operating power of advertising works because the person who wears a white coat convinces us that medically speaking, this is the best toothpaste you can buy. We do not recognize most of the time that the person in a white coat is an actor pretending to be a doctor. We don't understand that. What we do accept is here is a doctor telling us approved by the Indian Medical Council, this is good for you. Advertising works because the power of advertising is not visible. That the way in which the toothpaste makes money, the way the company makes profits will never be visible to us. It is this very glamorous, very hyped up medical knowledge, quote unquote medical knowledge because it's not always accurate medical knowledge that is being given to us as the authoritative way of dealing with toothpaste. What I'm proposing here is the medical and professional advice supposedly that comes to us on, on TV screens is something we ought to trust. That the person who's telling us may be relied upon. Ideology works by promoting beliefs and value systems of this kind. But it's important that these belief systems reinforce power relations. At this point, it is important to take cognizance of one more feature. I have already mentioned it in passing that power is made possible, power is reinforced, not through the imposition by the police or by the military, but through civil apparatuses. It is the Italian Marxist Antonio Gramsci who first made a major case that power operates through consent and not through coercion. That is, power works through our acceptance of the power, our acceptance of the authority, rather through, through being forced to accept that authority. That is, we concede, oh yes, we need this. We concede that they need to look after us and that we are not capable of looking after ourselves. This is what Marxists meant by the power of ideology. That ideology works because we consent to be governed, dominated and exploited. We accept this as true and therefore we do not protest. We concede our right to protest. We concede our right to resist by saying, you people in power, 
ought to continue to be in power and we remain powerless and ready to be governed. Consent rather than coercion is how ideology works. This is a very important development in later Marxist criticism. Antonio Gramsci is writing in the 20th century. The original Marxist notion of power and class conflict were created in the 19th century. Let me just refresh your minds about what we have been saying about base and superstructure. Marxism believes that there is an economic foundation, the social relations of production, the material conditions of production which include land, labor, wage, uh, the resources, the raw materials that are put in organization and then there is a superstructure which includes culture. So simple formula, economic base, cultural superstructure. Marxism emphasizes that all cultural practices draw upon the material base. Class conflict, capitalism, domination of the working classes are all manifest as political power in the superstructure. Once the upper classes obtain power, the next step is to retain power and that is possible only when you keep your cultural practices very much rooted in material conditions. Components of civil society such as films and art and uh, popular culture reinforce, help reinforce power relations. What Marxism proposes is that cultural forms perpetuate power relations. Whether it's a Shakespeare play or a Yashopra film, what you are seeing is the masking of very real material practices. Nobody quite knows where the wealth in all those big rich families come from, comes from in television serials or in films. Nobody asks when we are watching any of the Yash Chopra or the Barjatya films, how much salary do the servants get? Do we ask that question? We don't. We just assume that servants are happy because they are shown as being happy. It's important to understand this. We do not ask the question about the economic conditions because we are so caught up in the superstructure. We do not ask very pertinent questions about the nature of labor, the nature of wages, are they getting equal wages because the glamour of the superstructure makes very sure that the base is kept invisible. It's not brought to the forefront at all. So base and superstructure are in a sense independent for us because we don't see the base. We don't, we, unless we are analytical enough, we don't recognize that there is an economic foundation to all this. Later Marxists like Louis Althusser argued that the superstructure is more or less separate from the base, what they refer to as a relative autonomy. As an example to understand this particular instance, let's look at the Anna Hazare campaign. What does the Anna Hazare campaign do? What does it build on? Please note the Hazare campaign builds on Gandhianism and Gandhian thought. Gandhi and Gandhian thought are more or less 100 years old. Then why is it coming back now? On what grounds are we revisiting Gandhi? Certain cultural forms continue to exist in certain ways. Residual culture, as the Marxists call it, is a continuity of cultural practices and cultural forms in a slightly different version, but it exists nevertheless. So the revival of Gandhi and Gandhian thought by Anna Hazare's anti-corruption movement and political movement and political mobilization is an instance of residual cultures where something from long ago something of a different context remains with us now. It is used in particular ways now. If you look at the Narmada campaigns, the Chipko movements, many of the protest movements in India have made use of the Satyagraha, for example, which was a Gandhian system of 
protest. This revival of residual cultural forms constitutes a major shift in the way protests are launched now in India. That's one part, the residual cultures. However, alongside residual cultures is what we can think of as a dominant cultural form, which is capitalism and consumer culture. The dominant cultural form is interesting, particularly in India, where on the one hand we have the Hazare kind of Gandhian movement, and on the other hand we have the lavish lifestyles and consumerist cultures of metropolises, of Mukesh Ambani's 27 floor house, and so on. Dominant culture is what is most visible. It is what is most, let us say, prominent in what we see across media forms and in our own lives, the celebrity weddings, the celebrity lifestyles that newspapers and magazines seem to continually discuss. So, dominant culture, capitalism and consumer cultures, residual cultures, Gandhianism, Satyagraha, protest movements, Ambedkarite movements for social equalities, all are parts of a society in transmission and transformation. Finally, new forms of culture also evolve alongside traditional forms. For example, if you look at any corporate house today, you will see that corporate houses emphasize their social responsibilities. All multinational corporation houses, whether it's Infosys or uh, HSBC and other organization, Cognizant Technologies and Accenture, have a separate section to as corporate or social responsibilities. They do tree planting, they go work in the NGO sector, they help children, they, they do all sorts of things. They regulate traffic most of the time actually uh, as well. What are these acts? What we are looking at is emergent cultures. After dominant and residual cultures, we now start thinking in terms of emergent cultures where a whole new cultural practice or cultural form begins to come out of the same social systems. Emergent cultures will include the creation of new value systems, new belief systems, and new cultural practices. It must be emphasized that these cultural forms cannot be very accurately pinned down to economic conditions for the simple reason that sometimes cultural forms drop on an earlier form. I mentioned the Hazare campaign. You can very well ask at this point, how is the Hazare campaign connected to present material conditions. If the superstructure is a Hazare campaign, then the base should be a present economic condition. But obviously it is not based upon present economic conditions and material conditions at all. That is the point I'm trying to make. The Hazare campaign draws upon a predecessor moment. I'm referring to it as residual cultures because the Hazare campaign depends upon and draws its inspiration from its methods from a social condition that does not exist anymore. Right? So it's residual because it's left over from a previous era. Now, that brings us to the conclusion of Marxist critical thought. Let me quickly now summarize what we've been talking about. Marxist criticism is materialist criticism. It's materialist because it links cultural practices such as religion or art, film and literature and music to material conditions. These material conditions are conditions of labor, they're conditions of economics, they're conditions of ownership, landlords, capitalists, factory production. The economic conditions constitute the base. The cultural practices and forms constitute the superstructure. And Marxist criticism argues that the superstructure is founded upon the economic base. It further argues that since society is full of class conflict, upper classes who have power seek to retain power by using certain methods in civil society, not necessarily through force. We consent to be governed when we absorb values and beliefs passed on to us through things like films or fiction or literature. The belief systems that help retain power relations is called ideology. Ideology, which is the Marxist call false consciousness, enables the upper classes to retain power because the dominated accept it. It's false consciousness because we believe that there is a power relation. 
we believe that some people are entitled to power and some people will remain oppressed. It's important to understand here that false consciousness or ideology is what enables the upper classes, the people in power, to retain power. Without ideology, there is no power relation. It prevents people from protesting. What is very clear is Marxist literary criticism makes a major case. It's perhaps the only criticism which makes such an important case for reading any cultural practice within economic terms, within economic conditions. It's important to understand that all Marxist criticism therefore also has a more uh, revolutionary potential than any other criticism because its belief is in a system of thought where conditions of production must be examined and the way culture masks these factors of production must also therefore be critically examined. Thank you.